In this video, we will discuss the different life processes. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, please subscribe and press the bell icon to get all the latest updates. We have been studying about living and non-living things. With the help of certain characteristics, we distinguish between living and non-living things. A dog wagging its tail, an ant crawling. Are these living things? Yes, they are, because they are moving. So, movement is a sign of living. You sow a seed in soil. After few weeks, you find a plantlet growing. On basing the character growth, we say the plant is a living thing. So, in the above cases, movement and growth are the indicators of life. But sometimes, we find living things without any movement. Examples, this sleeping dog and this cactus. At this instance, we do not notice neither movement nor growth in the above two. It doesn't mean that they are not living. They have movements that are not visible to our naked eyes. If movements are there, where are they? We all know that living things are made up of organs, made up of tissues, finally cells. Cells are made up of molecules. In a living cell, there is a continuous movement of molecules. These movements are essential for repair and maintenance processes. These repair and maintenance processes are called life processes. Now let us see what are life processes. Life processes importance. All living things are made up of cells. Cells are made up of molecules. For a cell to be alive, it has to be repaired and maintained all the time. Repair and maintenance of a cell needs a continuous supply of new molecules and disposal of unwanted molecules. This task is achieved by a set of processes called life processes. Nutrition is a life process in which food is obtained by the organism and converted to simpler molecules that is nutrients. These are supplied to the cells by the transport system. Respiration is a life process in which oxygen is obtained by the organism and supplied to the cells by the transport system. Cells utilize some of these nutrients and oxygen to produce energy. Some nutrients are used for synthesis of new materials for growth and repair. While carrying out the above activities, cells generate certain molecules which are toxic and to be excreted out of the body. Excretion is the life process in which living organisms excrete the toxic materials out of the cells by the help of transport system. Transportation is the life process that helps in the transport of materials in nutrition, respiration and excretion. So nutrition, respiration, transportation and excretion are the four life processes essential for an organism to live. Now, under autotrophic nutrition, we will see nutrition in plants. Nutrition in plants is autotrophic, means self-feeding. Plants prepare their food by using simple inorganic materials like water, carbon dioxide and sunlight. This process is called photosynthesis. It takes place inside the leaf. But exactly where does it happen inside the leaf? If we see the cross-section of a leaf, we will find the cells with green colored structures called chloroplasts. This is the exact site of photosynthesis. Then how do plants get their raw materials for photosynthesis? Carbon dioxide enters the leaf through small pores called stomata present on the underside of the leaf. Water is absorbed from the soil by the roots. The exposure of leaf surface to the sun enables it to get enough sunlight for photosynthesis. Let us see the steps involved in it. Step 1. Chlorophyll molecules get activated by the sunlight. Step 2. Activated chlorophylls splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Step 3. Hydrogens generated in step 2 are utilized to reduce the carbon dioxide to glucose. Plants also need nitrogen to make proteins to build up their bodies. Atmospheric nitrogen is made into nitrites and nitrates by the soil bacteria.
they get it from the soil in the form of nitrites and nitrates. Now let us see nutrition in human beings under the topic heterotrophic nutrition. Food enters our body through mouth and travels through a long canal which ends at anus. This canal is called alimentary canal. In the mouth, the food is ground to a paste by teeth and saliva. Saliva is a watery fluid not only makes the food soft and wet, it also has an enzyme called salivary amylase which partially digests the sugars. Now, the food has to reach the stomach through a pipe called esophagus. The muscles of the esophagus contract rhythmically to move the food through it into the stomach. Stomach is a large muscular hollow organ in which the food is thoroughly mixed with more digestive juices secreted by gastric glands present in the walls of the stomach. These juices include 1. Pepsin, a protein digesting enzyme, 2. Hydrochloric acid to provide acidic medium for the proper action of pepsin and 3. Mucus to prevent the damage of stomach wall by the action of HCL. At the end of the stomach, a sphincter muscle slowly releases the food into the small intestine, the longest part of the alimentary canal, which is highly coiled to get accommodated in small space. It receives pancreatic juice from the pancreas intestinal juices from the glands in the intestines and bile juice from the liver. Pancreatic juice and intestinal juices contain enzymes like trypsin, lipase, pancreatic amylase, peptidases and nucleases. Bile does two things. 1. It breaks the fats into smaller droplets providing more surface area for the quick action of enzymes. Two. Bile makes the intestinal pH to alkaline, so by that the digestion of fats and carbohydrates is facilitated. These enzymes finally make the carbohydrates to sugars, proteins to amino acids and fats to fatty acids and glycerol. The inner lining of the small intestine has finger-like projections called villi, where the nutrients derived in digestion are absorbed into the bloodstream. The unabsorbed food is sent into a large intestine where water is absorbed and the rest is excreted out through anus. We will move to the next topic, respiration. First, let us see cellular respiration. Nutrition provides us with nutrients like glucose. Respiration helps in the release of energy from glucose. Some organisms need oxygen to do this job. In that case, it is called aerobic respiration. In aerobic respiration, one glucose molecule with six carbons splits into two molecules of pyruvate containing each three carbons. This happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. These pyruvic acid molecules enters mitochondria and turns to carbon dioxide and water by releasing the energy in the form of ATP. ATPs fuel the different endothermic reactions that takes place inside these cells. Respiration takes place in the absence of oxygen, which is called as anaerobic respiration. When we do vigorous exercise, our muscle cells get deprived of oxygen. In such cases, glucose is converted to pyruvate and which in turn gives out lactic acid and energy. In case of yeast and an aerobic organism, glucose is converted to pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid releases energy by converting into ethanol and carbon dioxide. This process is called fermentation. The energy released in aerobic respiration is greater when compared with the anaerobic respiration. But aerobic respiration requires a continuous supply of oxygen. Plants have stomata to exchange the gases with the atmosphere, whereas animals have special respiratory organs to get the oxygen from their surroundings. Now let us see how the breathing takes place in human beings. Breathing is an essential part of respiration. It allows the organisms to obtain the oxygen from the surroundings. Human beings have a well-developed respiratory system to absorb the oxygen from the atmosphere. Let's see the structural and functional details of each part of it. 
Human respiratory system begins with a pair of nostrils through which air enters our body. Nostrils are lined by fine hairs to filter the dust that enters in. Nostrils leads to nasal passage which is wet to humidify the air. From here, the air passes through the throat into the lungs. Throat is supported by C-shaped cartilaginous rings to prevent it from collapsing. The windpipe branches into bronchi, bronchioles and finally attaches to small balloon-like structures called alveoli. The walls of the alveoli are richly supplied with blood vessels and this is the exact site where the exchange of gases takes place in your lungs. The blood brings carbon dioxide from the rest of the body for release into the alveoli. The air in the alveoli is rich in oxygen. Now the exchange of gases takes place between alveoli and blood by simple diffusion. A red colored pigment called hemoglobin binds the oxygen and transports it. Carbon dioxide is generally dissolved in the blood during transport. Now let us move to the next topic, transportation. Transportation in human beings. Transportation is the life process that helps in the transport of materials in nutrition, respiration and excretion. Heart, blood vessels and blood are the parts of our transport system. How an electric pump pushes the water in the pipes, just in the similar way heart pumps blood in the blood vessels to different parts of our body. Heart is a muscular, four-chambered organ which is in the size of our fist. It has to do two different jobs. One, it has to collect the deoxygenated blood from the body parts and send it to lungs. This is done by the right side chambers, right atrium and right ventricle of the heart. Two, it has to collect the oxygenated blood from lungs and supply it to the body parts. This is achieved by the left side chambers of the heart. But it does both the jobs simultaneously. Let's see how it does in action. The left atrium and the right atrium relaxes. Left atrium collects the blood from lungs. Right atrium gets the deoxygenated blood from the body. As they contract, the left ventricle and right ventricle expands so that the blood is transferred to them. When the left ventricle contracts in its turn, the blood is pumped out to the body. The right ventricle contracts in its turn, pumps the blood to the lungs for oxygenation. In higher animals like birds and mammals, the four-chambered heart keeps the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood separate. The circulation of blood through the heart takes place twice, once between the heart and lungs and the second time between heart and body parts. Hence, this circulation is called double circulation. Now let us know about human blood, blood vessels and lymph. The blood vessels present in our body are arteries, veins and capillaries. Arteries are the vessels that have thick and elastic walls to resist pressure exerted by the heart. They carry the oxygenated blood from heart to various parts of the body. Veins They collect the deoxygenated blood from various parts of the body and brings it to the heart. They do not need thick walls because the blood is not under pressure, but they have valves to control the flow of blood in one direction. The arteries branch into thin vessels called capillaries to reach the cells for the supply of materials. These capillaries rejoin at the other end to form veins. If the blood vessels are cut at any point by incident, then there will be leakage and loss of blood from the body. To prevent this, platelets present in the blood migrate to site of leakage and plug it temporarily. Later, a series of events takes place and permanent clotting of blood takes place. Apart from blood, there is one more fluid involved in transportation, that is lymph. It is a colorless fluid similar to plasma of blood. It is formed by the plasma escaped from the capillaries into the intercellular spaces. This fluid is called lymph 
and it enters into lymphatic capillaries and joins with lymph vessels and finally opens into large veins. It does two major jobs. 1. Lymph carries digested and absorbed fat from intestine and 2. Drain excess fluid from extracellular space back into the blood. Move on to the next topic, excretion. Let's see excretion in human beings. Cells as a part of their activity, they produce nitrogenous compounds like urea and uric acid. These are toxic in nature and are to be excreted out from our body. Blood collects these compounds and carry them to the excretory system to filter them out. The human excretory system consists of a pair of kidneys, two ureters, an urinary bladder and urethra. Nephrons are the functional units of kidneys, which actually filters the blood. Each nephron consists of a cluster of capillaries and a tube with cup-shaped end called Bowman's capsule. Blood is filtered in this capsule and toxic wastes like urea, uric acid, creatinine along with water are separated. Certain useful materials like glucose, amino acids and salts are also filtered but reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. The water with toxic waste molecules collected in the kidney is called urine. It is sent to the urinary bladder through ureter. Once the bladder is full, it creates an urge to urinate. When we relax the bladder muscles to urinate, it passes out through urethra. And finally we see transportation in plants. Plants have slow transport systems because of their low energy need. In plants, the materials are mainly transported in two pathways. One, food materials from the site of production to the site of storage, that is, from leaf to stem or root. This conductive tissue is called phloem. The transport of this soluble product of photosynthesis from the leaf to other parts is called translocation. The translocation of food and other substances take place in the sieve tubes with the help of adjacent companion cells both in upward and downward directions. The translocation in phloem is achieved by utilizing energy. Materials like sucrose is transferred in phloem tissue using energy from ATP. This increases the osmotic pressure of the tissue causing water to move into it. This pressure moves the material in the phloem to tissues which have less pressure. This allows the phloem to move material according to the plant's needs. For example, in the spring, sugar stored in root or stem tissue would be transported to the buds which need energy to grow. 2. Water and minerals are conducted from root to other body parts through a specialized tissue called xylem. It consists of vessels and tracheids through which roots, stems and leaves are interconnected to form a continuous system of water conducting channels. At the roots, cells in contact with the soil actively take up ions. This creates a difference in the concentration of these ions between the root and the soil. Water therefore moves into the root from the soil to eliminate this difference. The effect of root pressure in transport of water is more important at night. During the day, when the stomata are open, the transpiration pull becomes the major driving force in the movement of water in the xylem. Watching, if you like the video, please give us a like and don't forget to post your comments.